Hey everyone, I'm B for Verbatim, and I'm like the least qualified person to talk about anything, but here we go! Today I'm starting a three-part video series about my favorite horror director and his three most well-known projects. He's the creator of Monkey Paw Productions, he's a brilliant storyteller and a masterful commentator on societal issues such as racial inequality, commercialism, and gentrification. If you don't know by now, that director is Jordan Peele, the director of Get Out, Us, and the producer for Candyman. And those are the three movies we're going to be talking about in this series, starting with Get Out. And for the sake of my own fun, I decided to redesign has been hotel characters to go on top of this video. Which, if you haven't watched the pilot for the show and you're between the ages 14 and 20-something, consider this a recommendation. Anyway, I decided to combine the two because there's a dear theme in both the design of the character and in the story that we're going to be talking about today. So that's my loose connection for these two things. But for now, let's talk about a five-year-old movie that most people have seen already. Don't worry, with the context of the last few years, this shouldn't just be a recap, and it's definitely important to reassess the movie, considering all the things that have happened in these last few years. The movie was made in 2017 by Jordan Peele. It's also a Blumhouse movie, which means it's either the peak of storytelling on a budget or a total shit show. The entire film was shot in 23 days, and while I'm no director, that does sound impressive to me. The movie was made on a budget of about 4.5 million and it made over 250 million, so I consider that at least a win. The movie's about a black man named Chris and his white girlfriend Rose going to visit their totally not racist I would have elected Obama for a third term. I have black friends, parents. Those kind of people. They hit a deer on the way, which sets up this parallel between deer and Chris's childhood. And our first sign that this movie may possibly be themed around race makes itself known pretty early on when a police officer is, in very simple terms, being a racist asshole. They make it to the family's house and things are immediately not right. There's just this weird energy with the whole family. The only caregivers that they have, Walter and Georgina, are black and they act and sound really off. Chris gets hypnotized by Rose's mother, his phone keeps getting taken off of its charger by housekeeper Georgina, and there's this weird party where people are acting off the whole time, and even more insulting, they treat his identity as a black man as some kind of weird fashion statement. He's knocked out and betrayed by his too-good-to-be-true girlfriend, and we find out that this family puts their brains in the heads of black people after hypnotizing them, so that they can evolve and become stronger, faster, more fashionable. Chris manages to break out of his prison with some quick thinking and armchair cotton taking down Rose's brother, father, mother, brother again, and finally Rose herself. The two housekeepers, who were actually Rose's grandparents and new bodies, are taken down as well, and the people the bodies once belonged to are freed. But you're not here for the summary, so let's talk about what's good, what's bad, and why this movie really matters even now. So I always like to start with criticism, since I like to end on a positive note with movie reviews. There isn't a lot to talk about though, and this is mostly nitpicky. But firstly, the pacing at the end of the movie is just, well, maybe it's just me, but I felt like the final confrontations with the family were just a little too quick. It really isn't that big of a deal. It's more about Chris Rose and Chris's childhood regrets of his mother that that final act is focusing on. In fact, the last part of the final act scene with Chris taking down his ex and putting the family's other victims out of their misery was paced really well, but the family was just disposed of really quickly Maybe it's just my personal bias, but I thought they needed to suffer a little more. Second, while I think the subject of racism and invalidating the black experience is a great way to take the film, I also think that the subtlety towards the middle was somewhat lost. The whole party scene and the dialogue of the guests felt very stereotypical, like phrases you would hear like stereotypically being thrown around, like literally the only one missing from the racism bingo was I have black friends. I just don't see a guy that knows they've kidnapped black people would be like, black is in fashion. No matter how secretive these guys are, I feel like being so blatantly enamored with black people as an aesthetic would be a tip off to the admittedly not reliable racist police that something shady was going on at that super isolated house that holds parties every time a black person goes missing. I don't know, I just feel like dots would line up at some point. And that's just a problem with realism, and obviously this is a movie and not real life, but come on. And I think this is the last big thing, but regarding the mother effing PDA guy, but he's just... It's so frustrating. I love the guy, but he's tonal whiplash incarnate. Yes, he's hilarious every time he's on screen, but like, can somebody else be? When the somewhat comedic tone of the film is dependent on one character, 
It just feels like a tone issue when nobody else is being funny or making jokes. Or if you want to tell a serious story, having this one character that feels like he's from another world and how funny he is is just... I don't know, I feel like this is unfair though. Like, the whole contrast between the super disturbing white family compared to Chris's friend being the warm, boisterous presence gives the outside world the safe world a distinct feeling from the claustrophobic family house, but tonally the movie just suffers with there being this weird whiplash when you have those scenes that are also some of the best scenes. But enough bitching about a movie I really like, let's actually talk about the good stuff. So firstly, the characters and the acting are both very solid. Like, you'd have these individual scenes with maybe one or two characters, and all of those scenes just feel like the energy and the acting and it's like the character are so palpable in those scenes. The most iconic example is obviously Chris and Rose's mother talking about Chris's mother and that hypnotism scene. It's obviously been memed to death, but when you go back and watch it, I think it's my third or fourth time watching this movie, but going back and watching it, you can just feel the energy. You know exactly what the mother wants, you know exactly what Chris wants, you know exactly who they are in that scene, and you know why they're there. It feels so organic and yet so filled to the brim with drama, and it's just really, really impressive how they did that. I really enjoyed that scene, but also just scenes with Chris talking to the housekeepers. Like, you can like you can feel there's something underneath with the housekeepers, under, like underneath the surface. It feels like their eyes are so glassy because, like, the people that were once behind those eyes are, like, gone, and it feels like they're placeholders and it's just really cool the way that they acted for those scenes just watching how everything is just so stiff i don't know i'm i'm, I'm at the point where i'm fangirling but basically i feel like when the movie needs to be stiff and slower paced it's the acting and the characters that are able to pull that off because of the way that they talk the way that they inflect the the way just the facial expressions are so impressive the whole time I'm already kind of getting into it, but my second point is that the pacing in this movie is so expertly fluctuating. Like, it's really fast when it needs to be fast, but what's more important and more impressive is that the pacing is slow purposefully at points, especially with conversations with the housekeepers like Georgina and just these individual one-on-one -on -one scenes, where the pacing is just slow so that it makes you feel uncomfortable. And that's kind of why this movie is so disturbing as well as being scary. In those moments, it feels like a character is on screen or making an expression or talking or there's a silence that's too long. And that's just that silence or that lack of moving forward and pacing, obviously, makes it feel more uncomfortable, like a small talk based conversation kind of thing. And it's impressive how Jordan Peele was able to get that slow pacing and use it to his advantage rather than have it be this issue that would normally be an issue with this kind of movie. Thirdly, the real perk of this movie is that re-watching the movie never feels like the same experience. There's always new ways to interpret things and new stuff to pick up on, and you really appreciate the movie after a few re-watches. Before I even watched the movie the first time, I watched a little bit of commentary about certain elements of the story that I probably wouldn't have picked up on until like maybe a second or third watch. And I imagine that's one of the downsides to having seen some commentary about it before. An example I can think of is Chris's girlfriend in one scene is eating cereal and milk separate. And I think that was meant to be an example of like separating white people like the milk from the colorful cereal being this like the black community. And I found that really interesting that that was the way that they went about symbolizing that. One other example I can think of off the top of my head that they talked about in the commentary that I watched was the use of cotton when Chris is trapped and he's using it to his advantage. Basically he puts the cotton in his ears so that he doesn't hear the hypnotizing sound that triggers him to fall asleep. Obviously when slavery was still really big in the south and even in the north to an extent, cotton farming was really synonymous with slavery and plantation farming and all of that and this movie did a spin on that where it's like he uses the cotton that his distant ancestors possibly used to pick hundreds of years ago and he uses it to his advantage to take down the white people that are suppressing him basically and it's really cool to see those little minor examples of that kind of thing 
but that's the kind of stuff that you get to enjoy on those rewatches. But the thing that I got to actually really appreciate in this new rewatch was Chris as a character. When I first watched the movie, and I th even the second time, he felt kind of bland to me. His responses were so minor, and it felt like he was like a surrogate for the audience in that you're supposed to be like living through him and being weirded out through him. But he didn't feel like much of a character to me at the time. Through this rewatch, I'm starting to really understand why he reacts the way he does. He's just seen all of this racist shit before and he doesn't want to make it a big thing like Rose tries to do as part of her act. And that's really interesting. A less subtle movie would have a protagonist that just gets offended or maybe just makes a big deal about all of these things that are happening. But Chris is just like, I've seen all of this crap before. I'm just so tired. And it's like, it's only a few days. We can get through this and it's, it's going to be fine. I'm here for Rose. I'm not here for them. It's really natural characterization, and once I understood that at like more fundamental level, I was able to actually sympathize with him and see him as a character because I actually understood his mindset, and it's just really... What I'm saying is that this movie opens up my stupid mind a little bit, because I am so dumb. Also, Mother Effing PDA is a national treasure. The whole way through the movie, I was laughing every time he would come on screen. He was just an uplifting presence. And this movie is his best, I think. Not that he was bad in Black Panther or in like the other projects that he's worked on, but him being the hero at the end of the movie to save Chris just felt so satisfying. Also, the setups and payoffs Jordan Peele is very well known for nowadays is on full display in this movie. Like the deer imagery especially. Chris's mom was killed in a hit and run, and he was not there to save her because he just he wasn't able to get to her in time, basically. The deer they hit on the way to Rose's family's house is kind of like symbolic of that death and inaction that he caused. And in the end, he uses a deer head and its antlers to kill Rose's father. So it's kind of him being more active and it's a good way to like pay off that setup with the, with the deer imagery again. And there's all these little clues you can pick up about the family's intentions. Even little things like the way that Georgina and Walter wear hats and cover their surgical scars with their hair is just really well done. You have to really see the movie to understand all the individual examples of the setup and payoffs that Jordan Peele manages to fit in there, but rest assured, it's all just really great. So we're going to do a lightning round for these last three, but first of all, the ending. The PD mother effing A, we handle shit, consider this shit effing handled. Need I say more, that scene was amazing. Secondly, the style was really cool. Whether you're a casual movie watcher or a critic, you have to respect that Jordan Peele has a style that he likes, and he definitely has established it and is very consistent about it, even with his directorial debut that he has here. And thirdly, this whole message about the romanticization of race is really important and interesting to discuss, and I'm actually going to go into more detail about that right now. So now for the big question. Why does any of this matter? It's just a movie. Why should anybody care? Well, obviously with 2020, the Black Lives Matter movement and all of that, it really brings to mind why this kind of movie is important. Because racism takes so many different forms. It can be subtle, it can be very blatant, it can be trying to take down another race, it can be raising them up. But either way, it's just this dehumanizing way to treat a fellow individual. And it's acting like their problems and their issues as an individual don't matter because all it comes down to is like the color of their skin. With people like George Floyd, there are a lot of people there to like support and bring justice to that kind of inaction or action that is definitely way overboard and not called for in the form of police brutality, but that's not always the case. Not every George Floyd is seen and given justice. This movie being one about race is a reminder that racism can be subtle. It's not necessarily a white person using the end slur and beating a guy up. It could be just this whole idea where it's like, well, we have to appear not racist, but like the subconscious racism existing underneath. With things like, I would have elected Obama for a third term, or I have black friends, those statements could easily be genuine, but just as easily be disingenuous, especially statements like that, where it's like, it feels like 
defensiveness. People desperately want to be seen as a good person, but sometimes it's at the expense of the person you're trying to kind of support, I think. Where you're just like, I need to seem like this supportive person, I need to be this person that is all about this race and all of their struggles and everything they are as, a peop as people, but then you forget about the actual people that are members of those minority groups and just, you it's a hyper fixation, I think. With last Black History Month and Black Lives Matter and all of that stuff that's been happening recently, this movie is a good place to kind of bring those thoughts together and kind of come to terms with a lot of stuff. Especially in regards to the romanticization of race. That, in a very subtle way, invalidates the experience of minorities just as much as the more easily recognizable forms of racism, like police brutality in relation to race. An example I can think of is people that are Asian. From what I've seen in media, the Asian stereotype is this like super genius that plays like five different instruments, has written concertos at like age five, this straight A honor roll student, and I don't, I don't think that's necessarily accurate every single time. That's romanticization of race, where like one race, white people seem to get the brunt of the blame for racism, but just where one race sees another as being stronger, faster, better in some way, and they want to be more like them, the romanticization becomes some form of envy, which eventually becomes violence. Maybe that's the stem of more violent, more blatantly negative forms of racism. And I don't feel like I'm necessarily qualified to talk about this, but it's just interesting to see these kind of things and see that there's different facets to racism that I don't think everybody talks about or thinks about. So, that's just my two cents on that. But outside the topic of race, let me get to something that's more up my alley, that feels like something I'm able to talk about personally, in the form of how this movie kind of changed film and changed Jordan Peele's career. This movie really paved the way for Jordan Peele to create movies like Us and help create movies like Candyman. This movie made over $250 million with a budget of $4.5 million. That's an incredible feat, especially because it gave people a movie to go to when talking about one of my favorite things about the horror genre, the societal and political commentary that can come from it. And this is just the directorial debut of Jordan Peele. In just one movie, he became a household name with a style other horror movies would imitate or parody, and it is very deserved. This movie's been memed to death, his other movies that followed have also been memed to death. His movies appeal to so many people, and they give horror a better name, I think. This film was just solid in writing, concept, and production, and it's that foundation that makes an audience more compelled to hear really important themes behind a project, which is definitely why horror movies and political commentary is like the perfect combination, and this movie just definitely exemplifies that fact. This film is a 9 out of 10, solidly. Maybe lower, maybe higher, but that's where I'm at right now. But what do you guys think? Did you think it was better? Worse? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, maybe accidentally click the subscribe button. I mean, I wouldn't mind. And if you have any helpful criticism for the redesign in this video, positive or negative, I'd really appreciate it. But that's all I have for today. This is V for Verbatim, signing off until the next video. Take care, and be excellent to each other. Bye!